Praise the Lord Jesus. I greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. I deem it a privilege for us to come together again one more night. Amen. To offer praises and worship and thanksgiving to our great God. Amen. And to hear and to receive from God's word tonight. You know, there, there's a scripture, amen, that declared that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. The Bible says that it is the word, uh, the word of God is what sanctifies us. It's the word of God which cleanses us. And I pray, God, that tonight, that at the end of this Bible study session, that we will be blessed and that we will leave uh, having received a word from God. Amen. Tonight we embark on the subject, our Christian walk. Amen. I mean, for the past uh, few weeks, for the first week, uh, three weeks ago, we did our Christian heritage. And if you can remember, we spoke about the things that we hold dear as Christians. Amen. The things that we hold dear as apostolics. The things that we, that cement us and, found, and, and build our foundation. Amen. As Christians, we spoke about the fact that the church is built upon the foundation of the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen. We spoke about the fact that the name of Jesus is still powerful as it was in the first century. And we did say that if there's anything that has changed in this time, it would not have, not have been our God because he changed not. He's immutable. But we are the ones who have changed. So sometimes we have to go back and see what we have missing from the formula and to get it together. We spoke about our Christian identity last week. Amen. And we spoke about the fact that there is a spiritual war that is going on over our identity. Amen. There is a spiritual war that is taking place over who you are. And we declared last week that the deception of the devil, uh, he is trying to deceive us into not realizing who we are as Christians. We said that, look here, we should not take any thing from the devil at all. And we quoted the scripture from St. John chapter 8, which declared that ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Praise God. So we spoke about the fact that uh, the devil will use our hurt and our pain. Amen. He will use uh, the things that we have gone through in the past. He'll use a society view and he'll use social media, amen, in order to try to get us to lose our identity. And how, how good that was last week that we found out that, look here, our past does not define us. How good it was that we learned that people have gone through hurt and pain in the past too, like Joseph. But we realized that everything that the enemy meant for evil, God was able to turn it around for good. We said that there is an identity crisis and we spoke about the twofold uh, things that are happening that is causing the crisis. We said, first of all, some people understand their purpose in the kingdom, but they do not know how to apply it. And we use the example of Moses who, even though he, was, he has learned about his Jewish root from his mother from an early age, amen, from as early as a, as a child, he grew up in the house of the Pharaoh, yes, but it was his mother who actually taught him the ways of the Lord. So when he got older, he knew that he was a Hebrew and he killed an Egyptian uh, doing something outside of how God would have it to do. So he was trying to do the right thing, but he did it the wrong way. Amen. And we, we look at the example that at the end of the day, in order for him to do the right thing uh, and to do it in the right way, he needed an encounter with the Lord. Praise God. So we looked at Moses' life and we realized that when he was sent into the wilderness, amen, and he came back for the children of Israel, amen, first time he only delivered one, but the second time he delivered over two million because of how it was done. So we say understanding your purpose is another thing, but knowing when to apply it, having an encounter with God is what is going to make the difference. We also say that some people don't know because of a lack of understanding of our or of what say, the Bible actually says about them. In other words, a lot of people operate outside of what the scriptures actually declare them to be. And therefore, because they are ignorant of who God say they are, amen, they do not know how to operate as Christians. So we did say that the more you agree with God about your identity in Christ, and we can only agree with God 
about our identity, when we know what the Word of God says, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your God-given identity. Amen. So each child of God uh, must come into alignment with what the Word of God says. Um, the Word of God says that you are the salt of the earth. The Word of God says that you are the light of the world. The Word of God says that you are an ambassador. And we name a few things that we brought out last week to say that the Word of God says that you are the head and not the tail. The Bible says that you are above and not beneath. Amen. The Bible actually says in Isaiah, Amen, praise God, that fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, you are mine. And we, we look at all of these things last week to show how important you are as a child of God to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. So we did look at the Christian heritage and we look at the Christian identity. This week we're going to take it a bit further and we're going to jump into what is called the Christian walk. Our Christian walk. Uh, and I want us to start by saying that as a Christian... Amen. The Christian, all of us are, are part of a particular journey. The Christian walk is a journey. Amen. And that means that a journey is an act of traveling from one place to another place. And that's simply what it is as we become Christians. The day you got saved, the day you received the Holy Ghost, God is moving you from one place to the other place. And we can look through scriptures, for example, just as the Israelites were on their way to possess the promised land. Amen. Uh, and we know what happened. God had to, 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 to take them out of Egypt first. And Egypt in scripture is a type of sin. Amen. In a similar way, God took us out of this world. God took us out of sin. Amen. Which is a form of repentance. And they went through the Red Sea, which is a form of baptism. And they went through, God was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to them, which is a form of the Holy Ghost. In a similar way, most of us have experienced this. And we are on a journey to a place, amen, where God has promised us. Amen. And therefore, our focus should not be on necessarily so much what we are experiencing as we go through the journey. Our ultimate focus must be where we are actually going. Amen. But while we are on the journey, we must understand that journey that we are going on goes between mountain tops and it goes between valleys. And this is very important for us to understand as children of God. Because one of the things that a lot of people uh, miss when they become into the house of God, is that they think that when they get into the house of God, the house of God is a place that is totally uh, free of hurt, totally free of troubles and trials and situation. But as I said before, we are on a journey. One of the things I used to love to do, amen, and even today I like doing it, I, I like to travel to the country. And one of the reasons why I love to do that is because on my way, I'm able to experience different things. I'm able to see different things. Amen. I, I love that. I like to drive on the highway part and then you know that part is smooth. And then you reach another part, it might be rocky. And you're experiencing different, different things as we move along the journey. Amen. But we know that our ultimate aim is not the journey per se. It, 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 we learn a lot from the journey. But we know we have a destination ahead. So like next week, our plan is to go into the Christian destiny. Amen. But while we are going there, let us try to look at some things that happen with us or happen to us along the Christian walk, along the Christian journey. Amen. As I said before, the journey that we travel in goes between mountain tops and it goes between valleys. Now, let me say, start by saying that they, they went normally in Christ, Christendom, we use the term mountain top and a lot of people if you're coming from the outside in the world amen probably true you can figure out what it means by mountain top after a while but it's really a christian terminology when we say boy your 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 christian life sometimes you're on the mountain and sometimes you're on the valley amen but these terminologies actually have significant meanings amen for example the term mountain top comes from those moments in scripture where god reveal himself to persons on the mountain. Amen. And, 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 and you know, amen, that when in, in different examples in scripture, something significant happened when persons were on the mountain. There was an encounter on the mountain that touched people's life and they will never forget it. Amen. For example, we look at the scripture in Genesis chapter 22 from verse 1 to 19. And Genesis chapter 22 spoke about the fact where Moses, amen, went to the mountain. 
And while he was on that mountain, he had an encounter where God tested him. And he was asked to offer his son um, um, Isaac. So as we go through the scriptures, we realize that Moses will never forget this encounter. And then God actually did something specific for him. Amen. While he was about to kill his son, God provided a lamb. Amen. And he, he, when he realized that God provided a lamb for him. Amen. And God said, don't kill his son. I've provided a lamb in the ticket. We call, he called God Jehovah Jireh. Amen. So the mountain was a very important thing for Moses, for Abraham, because it reminds him of how God was testing him and how God delivered him and give his son the victory. I give him the victory so his son could live. Amen. So that was his mountain top experience. You talk about Moses, who, when he went up into the mountain to get the Ten Commandments from the Lord in Exodus chapter 19 from verse 20 uh, to 20. From Exodus chapter 19 to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 21, we realize that Moses had an encounter in the mountain. Amen. God was able to speak with him. And for the period of time that he was there, amen, it was such a magnificent experience in the mountain. That when Moses came down from the mountain, praise God, the Bible said his face shone as light. Amen. To the point where people had to put a veil over his face. I mean, Moses will never forget that encounter that he has. And we can talk about even the, 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 the disciples, Peter, James, and John, who went up into the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. And it was here that God changed before them. And they saw Jesus not just as a man now, but he was, they saw him for who he truly was. God Almighty, he was glorified, he was magnified before them. Amen. To the point where Peter started talking something, let us build three tabernacles. He was so shocked by what he saw. That it, it gave him an experience and even God himself, don't tell the disciples and when they come down from the mountain what you have seen until I have been resurrected. But we know that how hard it must have been for these disciples because for the first time in all their walking with the Lord, they were able to see him in a totally different light. So the mountaintop experience, praise God, speaks to a time in your life, amen, an encounter in your life. Amen. That you will never forget. I can tell you some of your mountaintop experiences. Uh, one that comes to my mind is the day you got the Holy Ghost. Now, that is the biggest mountaintop experience. For I remember when I got the Holy Ghost. Amen. For days, you felt like you were on cloud nine. True or false? Amen. You felt like it was, it, 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 you could not sin anymore. You felt like, I mean, and, and for a period of time, your life felt like everything was perfect. I mean, there was no, there was, there was, there was no, Issue, amen. Even if you go back to work and you are upset with somebody, you'll be the first person to talk back to this person. You are on the cloud nine. You are in your mountain top experience. Some of us, amen, you can remember when, when we have done our fasting sessions, for example, we've gone five days of fasting or seven days of fasting or three days of fasting as a church. Amen. And you realize that at the end of that experience, amen, there is something that breaks inside of you. It's like a mountain top experience. Amen. We can talk about where God does some things in our lives and we realize how happy and joyous we feel by being in that experience. But as I said before, the Christian walk is a journey. And therefore, as Christians, God's intention is not for us to live, amen, forever on the mountaintop. Actually, amen, God's intention is for us to travel, amen, this walk, this Christian walk, to bring us to the place that we are truly in him. So we're going to have mountaintops. But guess what? The next place that is right behind it is the valley. Amen. The valley is right there, right beside it. So the term valley, in contrary to the mountaintop, amen, speaks of our pain. It speaks of our trials. It speaks of our tribulation. Amen. And can I tell you something, child of God? Every child of God, for you get saved, irrespective of who you are, you can mark this down. Your valley experience is coming. You are going to walk through a valley. And you're going to walk through a valley often more than once. You're going to have times of ups, but it's not going to be up forever. As a matter of fact, when you look back at the mountaintop experience, amen, they were just for a moment. Amen. They were not forever. Amen. In a similar way, your valley will come. And it's going to be often more than once, but it won't be forever. Amen. But I like the fact that the Bible declares that even when we're on the mountaintop or on the valley, 
The psalmist declared this in Psalms 23 verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, I will fear no evil. In other words, you're going to go through some things as a child of God. And it would not be good of us as ministers of the word to let you feel that when you become a Christian, everything is going to be okay all the time, every time. Amen. Paul described the experience, amen, what he has gone through as an apostle. He was beaten with many stripes. He was this and he was that. And he, was, he, he, he told his experience. And a lot of us, when we read what the apostle went through, amen, it would have blown your mind. Amen. But the scripture says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Amen. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In other words, irrespective of what you are going through as a child of God, we can rest assured that even if we are on the mountaintop or we are in the valley, amen, that God is with us. And that is what makes the difference in our lives. Can I tell you something? In the, when David wrote this particular psalm, he wrote it based on his understanding of how uh, God dealt with, uh, or the shepherd would have dealt with the sheep. Amen. And can I tell you something? There were times, especially in Palestine, and, and, and they knew this, in the winter time, what they would have done is that they would have taken the sheep down to the lowlands. And why they bring to the lowlands where there would be more grass and, and it would be much warmer. So, in, in other words, you know that if it's, it's, if it's a cold time, the lower you are, it's going to be warmer as opposed to the higher you are. Amen. But as soon as the certain season came upon them, the summer season, amen, and the temperature begins to rise in Palestine, then it, it would be the best thing for the shepherd, amen, to remove the sheep from the lowlands and bring them to higher grounds. Now, one of the things that happened when they were taking them from that point to the higher grounds is that they had to walk through the valley. Amen. They had to walk through the valley and the gorges uh, so that they can reach the mountain top. In other words, when God is about to do something magnificent in your life, amen, note, you know, they were in the lowlands, they were eating stuff, they were fine. But guess what? It was getting too hot for them there. And God knew that the best place for them to be was for them to be on the mountaintop at this time. But guess what? For them to reach the mountaintop, they had to walk through the valley and the gorges. And this is what David was talking about when he says, Yea, though I walk, because he was putting himself... Uh, as the sheep, being a shepherd himself, he knew the arrangement. In other words, God is going to take you from your valley and he's going to bring you to the mountaintop. But for you to reach the mountaintop, God must bring you through the valley and the gorges. Amen. But we can rest assured that at the end of this valley experience, at this gorge that we are going through, at this valley of shadow of death, that there is a mountaintop awaiting us. Better temperature. Amen. For at the time. Better grass, better thing that we need, amen, as sheep. God is going to bring us there. And as I think about that scripture, my mind goes back to a scripture in 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 23. And it says, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills, therefore they, are worse, therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And let me give you a background. If you start from verse uh, 1 of First Kings chapter 20, there was a king by the name of Ben-Hanadad. And what had happened is that he uh, joined himself with about 32 other kings, uh, according to the scripture. And he decided that he was conquering all the places around. They were putting everybody in fear. And he sent a message to King Ahab who was the king of Israel at the time. And he told him that, look here, I want your children, and I want your wives, and I want your silver, and you want your gold. Actually, he says, all of these things are already mine. Amen. And when King Ahab got the message, he said to King uh, Benadad, that, look here, okay, I will give these things to you. But one of the things I realized about how the enemy operates is that we never... And you should never sign an agreement with the enemy. Never you sign an agreement with the devil. Amen. If you give the devil an inch, he will take a mile. Amen. So Ben-Hanadad was not comfortable 
even though what he requested at first, amen, was that he got, amen, everything, as it were, from the king, the man, wife. I, I can believe the man look across at Jezebel and say, all right then, uh, all right, I'll give up Jezebel and I, will <laughs> and I will give up the children and I will give up the, the, the gold and the silver. Amen. I said, okay, let's tell Behana that. Because I strongly believe he was fearful of this particular king. But the king wanted more. So the king sent a message to him and said, look here, what is what we're going to do? We're going to send in all our soldiers. They're going to go to all the houses in Israel. And anything that they want, anything that they say goodly in the people's house, they're going to take it. That's how the devil operates. You give him an inch. He's going to come, and then he's going to come more, and he's going to want more and more. He is never satisfied. He is greedy, and he is wicked. Praise God. He's an evil one. He's a thief. Amen. He's a murderer. He's a liar. Amen. And the Bible says that when the message servant came back with that particular message, the king was kind of confused. So he called his elders, and he said, look here, this man wants to start war with us, because I already told him I'm going to give him this. And yet still the man said, no, man, he don't want, just want this. He want everything that I have. Can you imagine? That's how the enemy operates. He wanted everything. Amen. So the elders decide, say, look here, look, this is what we are going to do. Tell Behanadad that we are not going to have no deal with him. What he has asked, we're not going for that. So they sent out a message to the king, uh, Behanadad, by his servants. And he was furious and he told him that, look here, we're going to come and we're going to fight against you. We're going to kill everybody. We're going to wipe you out. Now, while he was doing that, uh, a prophet came to King Ahab and said to him, look here, go out and fight against them. Because guess what? We are going to win. God is going to give you the victory. God is going to give you the victory. Amen. And it's interesting because the Bible didn't name the prophet, which means that it was during the time probably one of the prophets that 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 remember when elijah ran and thought that he was the only prophet probably he was one of those prophets that, that the bible didn't name but did exist there's a man for the season and the man told him that look your god is going to give you the victory i said when should we go to go fight i said yeah man you can fight because god is going to give you the victory who must go out for us let the princes go out so 222 men from the princes and about seven thousand soldiers went out and they fought at the time when ben Hanadad was practically drinking and drunk, amen, with the other 32 kings, they went out and they fought with them. And they won the battle to the point where these men ran for their lives. They ran for their lives, amen. ben Hanadad jumped on a horse and he ran away, amen. And, and they, they, they got the victory. Now, while they got the victory, the prophet came back to the king and said, Look here, settle yourself. Make sure you keep your thing in order because in one year time, they're going to come back. And they're going to come back again. Now, while he was saying that, the advisors to Ben Hanadad was saying, Dear God, which is the scripture that we read, are gods of the hills. Because they believe in a localized God. They didn't realize that the God that we serve is a big Almighty God, there is nothing, there's no, there's no situation. Either you're on the mountain or the valley, he is still God and nothing can take that place from him. Amen. So they are advising them, look, if we fight them in the plain or in the valley, they're going to lose. But we know what happened. While they fought them and they came back the year to fight them in the, in the valley, just like they beat them in the mountains, they beat them in the valley. So like Syria today, praise God, which is, which is sad. A lot of people, even in church, uh, think that our God is a God of hills, but not a God of plains. In other words, they believe that while somebody, they, they only see when people going through the high things and they get this and they get that. But they don't realize that the same God, amen, who brought people to the hills. And you see people getting blessings and blessings is, I put blessing in quotes. Because blessing all the time is not necessarily material or physical. A lot of people get their blessings while they are going through their valley. Because that is the place where God restores your soul. That's the place where God deals with you as a person. So God is a God of hills, but not of the plains. That's what people believe. Some people believe that God is a God of the past, but not of the present. I, I, I rebuke that. So a lot of, and, I, and I can tell you how I know this. A lot of people will talk about what the apostles did. And what was happening in back in the day. But they don't see that these same things can happen today. Amen. Today, today, 2021, 
uh, July the 14th, you can lay your hands on somebody who is sick. Amen. And the same God that worked through the Apostle Paul and the same God that worked through Peter and so on and so forth can work through you. You have a sickness? Don't bother think that because God did it in the past and can't do it again. God does not change. Some people think God is a God of few special favorites, but not of all his people. If you're a child of God, even if you're least in the kingdom, amen, the Bible said the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Amen. In other words, no matter where you are, if you're a child of God, you can rest assured that God is not just a God of few special people. Amen. God is a God of all of us. And therefore, if you are, I remember uh, it was uh, Elder Purge. Amen. Who, was, who came one time and he spoke about the situation when a little girl got saved down and they had her hostage. And it was there, she was able to pray for somebody and pray them through to the Holy Ghost. Even though she was in a bad situation, God was able to use her to deliver persons. In other words, you're not too young, you're not too big, you're not too small, you're not too illiterate, you're not too whatever the case is that you see yourself to think that God cannot use you. God is not a God of special persons. God is a God of all of us. And God is not a God of one kind of trial. And not a God of another time. It doesn't matter what the trial is. Amen. God is able to be a God both of the mountain top and he's a God of the valley. He's a God of your trial irrespective of how big the trial is. And it doesn't matter the type of trial. You have cancer, God can heal you. Amen. You're going through situations, God can deliver you. Because God is the same God. And let us never make the mistake. Like the Syrians make. Amen. No many enemy try to fool you up and tell you that God cannot do that thing for you because your situation is so bad. To God, we, we, we come against that in the name of Jesus Christ because the God of the mountains is the God of the valley. So as Christians, we are going to travel this walk. We are going to walk on the mountain top at times and we are going to walk through the valley at times. But we serve a God who is a God of the mountain and a God of the valley. So what do you do then, child of God, as we walk this Christian walk? What is the best option for us then whenever we come to our valley experience? Amen. Can I tell you something? A lot of people, when they reach the valley, amen, and depending on how deep the valley is and how dry the valley is or how crooked it look, that's the point in time where they decide uh, to give up or to turn back. Amen. But my encouraging word to you tonight, amen, is that if you're going through your valley experience, my thing to you tonight is that you must keep on walking. Keep walking. Because we're talking about this Christian walk. Do not stop walking. Walk by faith, not by sight. I guess what? You can't afford to stop and analyze why you had to enter. Don't do that. The devil wants to confuse you. Put on your blinders and know that you are focused. You are, you, are, you are going through this valley, but keep on walking. You know why you must keep on walking too? Because there is a better place. And God is going to bring you there. As I said before, the sheep was going through the valley. But as he, if he stopped in the valley, he probably would have died. Because, the, the, because of fear and whatever. But as long as God is with him and God is leading him through the valley, keep on walking through the valley. Because I assure you that at the end of that valley experience, there is a mountain top. Amen. Before the, 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 the dawn of the morning, amen, the, the, the darkest part of the night comes right before the opening of the morning so at the end of the day we can be assured that god is going to bring us out so guess what keep on walking and guess what there's something about the valley that is very important too the valley keep on walking because this valley is making you into a pearl the valley is making you into a pearl now let me show you what the pearl looks like this is what the pearl looks like child of God. Now, here it is that the pearl uh, is practically, you can see it, uh, it's very valuable. It is, it is it, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it values a lot of money. Amen. And I think it's made out of, the, I think there's an oyster who actually holds it. Uh, right. So it is, it is very valuable. Amen. And, and the, 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 the oyster would have practically make the pearl. Now, it is said that the pearl is one of the most valuable gems known to mankind. My God. But you know how the pearl is made? It is said that 
a little crack in the shell of the oyster leaves an opening for sand to make its way inside of the, the oyster shell. And guess what happened now? Because the sand goes inside of the oyster shell, it makes it uncomfortable. So the irritation from the sand actually creates a secretion and a coating. And over time, because it keeps on being irritated and the, the coating and the secretion that comes from it, it produces a pearl. Can I tell you something also? All oysters do not produce pearls. Very important. All oysters do not produce pearls. You know what happened? Pearls come from the oysters that recover from the irritation and the wound. So a pearl is basically a healed wound. What a thing. So guess what? Look at it this way, child of God. No wound, no treasure. I wonder if you could want to say that. No wound, no treasure. In other words, your situation might be uncomfortable right now. You might be like that pearl where sun has come in and it seems as if it's creating a problem. But guess what? If you keep, keep it, and you, if you recover from the irritation, the wounds that will be created is practically the pearl. Because the pearl is basically healing wound. And guess what? This is funny. The pearl is healing wound. So it means that at the end of the day, if you have no wounds, you have no treasure. What am I saying? One of the most valuable gems known to mankind comes out of problems and situations and troubles. What a God. So guess what? When you're going through your valley experience, have it in the back of your mind that God is making a pearl out of me. God is turning me into a valuable treasure. Amen. God is turning me into the person he wants me to be. I might have come in like a grain of sand, but when I mixed with the oyster, and the, and, the, and, and, and the secretion and all of these things combined together, the irritation that comes from that. When, that. when I recover from that, what I produce is so valuable that it's going to blow the minds of everybody. The devil don't want you to know that. And that is why a lot of people, when they get into certain situations, amen, they lose the fight because they don't have a, the vision enough to realize that where you are going and what God is doing and how God is producing the thing, amen, is making a much more beautiful thing. It's like an artist. He begins to paint, amen. At the beginning, you're not seeing it. And a lot of artists paint like this. You're not seeing the full work. You're just seeing pieces. You're seeing colors. You probably can make out a little piece here and a little piece there, amen. But if you stay and allow the painter to continue to paint, Amen. Or the artist to continue to draw. After a while, we see the true picture. All we need to do is to remain as the canvas and allow the artist to work. In a similar way, just remain in the valley and keep walking. And God will bring you out to the point where you become his treasure. No wound, no treasure. Praise God. So, we are aware that the journey is practically up and it is down. But irrespective perspective of where we are in the journey God is concerned that our walk is in keeping with his work in other words if you're on the mountain top or you're in the valley what is the consistent thing amen for us as children of God is to ensure that either if you're on the mountain top or the valley our walk as children of God is in keeping with what the word of God says it doesn't matter the outside situation, doesn't matter the climatic situation, doesn't matter if it's sunny today or it's rainy. Amen. What should be consistent is the word of God in your life. So look at what Paul said to the church at Ephesus in relation to the walk. He said in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 to 16, See then that ye walk circumspectly. Amen. Not as fools, but as wise. In other words, there's a possibility that you can walk, amen, and not walk as a wise person. You can walk as a fool. He said, 
See that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly is from the Greek word akribose. And it means accurately or diligently. Amen. So see that you walk circumspectly. See that you walk accurately. See that you walk diligently. Not as a fool, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. In other words, we have to ensure that as we walk, we walk as God would have us to walk. Now, a lot of times in the New Testament, amen, we see the word walk. And there are three Greek words that are used for the word walk uh, in the New Testament. And, I mean, we really could go deeper in, 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 in this and analyzing it in terms of a word study. But that's not our aim tonight. What you can do as a child, as a Bible student, what you can do as Christians, amen, is to do your own word study on the word walk. And you will see one of these three words. But why I did that is because I want to show you that at different points in time, you might see the same English word, amen, but it might have a different meaning. It's just like when we see the word word in scripture, amen, in one case, we might see the word logos, amen, which actually speaks to uh, uh, the thought or a plan. Or in another case, we might see the same English word word, but it's not logos. It is the word rima, amen. We speak to the spoken word and so on and so forth. So at different points in time, the English Bible might use one word, but it might have different meaning. And I want you to bring that out as we talk about the word walk in the New Testament. You have peripatio, which means to walk or to walk around. And, 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 and that's, 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 that's not going to be the first word that you think about. Now, when you think about a walk, you think about walking around. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew. So that word here, Jesus, walking by the sea, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, is that first Greek word. They have start who? Means to march in step, to march in rank, to walk in agreement with. To function in a system to follow a leader from the ranks. In other words, in the New Testament, there are cases where the apostles will tell us that we need to walk this particular way. Walk means, in that context, to follow the person who God has placed above you. It's just like the sheep had to follow the shepherd. Amen. In a similar way, as Christians, God has placed, amen, an under-shepherd. Amen. And God himself is the ultimate shepherd, but he has placed an under shepherd. And it was the apostle Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. We are living in a time where people think it's okay to be disrespectful, amen, to leadership. People think it's okay and it's a good thing to say, can't no man, pastor, don't know where I do. And I loved how the preacher brought the cross on Sunday. Amen. In relation to we as Christians, we need to be uh, at a place where we realize that in this Christian walk, amen, walk means that we should follow leaders from the ranks. It means that we must walk in agreement with. And we're going to talk about that. And there's another word, uh, permit, which means to go, to proceed, to travel, to conduct oneself in a certain manner, to live. Amen. So there is a, these are the three words that when the Bible talks about walk in the New Testament, it can mean to walk around, it can mean to follow a leader from the ranks, and it can mean to walk in a certain manner of life. So it's point two and point three is where I am very much focused on as we relate to the Christian walk. We must walk in respect to who God has placed above us as long as they are walking in relation to the word. And two, in our very, very lives, how we live, the manner of life that we have must be in linkage with what the word of God actually says. So if we should summarize, amen, point two and point three, amen, in relation to the Christian walk, we would say that the Christian walk speaks to the life of the Christian. In other words, how you live your life as a Christian is very important to God. Amen. In other words, how you live your life at work, how you live your life at home, how you live your life at school. Amen. The life of a Christian speaks to the walk of the Christian. So it, the life is very important and is a part of how the Christian should live. It also, the walk also speaks to the direction of the Christian. Because as a Christian, we can either walk as Christians moving from 
uh, glory to glory in him, moving from hope to hope, moving from faith to faith, amen, moving from, from, from we are progressing in the kingdom of God. But our direction can also be going in the opposite direction, amen, in the sense that you have people, when they got the Holy Ghost, they were so in love with God. Amen. They spent a lot of time in the presence of God for the first year, two years. They were so much in love. But check them after five years, six years. And we realize that the direction is not where it should be. And you know the funny thing? Uh, one minister used to always talk about drifting. And it's, and, 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 and it's a serious thing because what will happen is that you're, you're fixed on Jesus Christ as you got saved. But after a while, the enemy comes in, the wind begins to blow, and instead of you setting back the sail to ensure that it's keeping its direction, you allow the wind of life, you allow the situation of life to drift you. And you'll be surprised if you drift by a little bit, amen, the further out you go is the farther you go from the target, amen. So we have to, as Christians in our walk, we have to monitor the direction that we are going. It speaks to your character. Amen. Do you love? Amen. We talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Is it being manifested in your life? We look at St. John chapter 5. We talk about the characteristics of how the Christian should live. Do these things uh, uh, speak to your life? So, for example, when we look at the scripture that declares, amen, that if your enemy asks you to go one mile, well, the scripture never said that. The Bible says, if a man asks you to go one mile, he must go with him too. Amen. And that scripture was practically talking about how we deal with our enemies in the sense that in the Roman uh, civilization, it was customary for them to ask the slaves at the time, amen, to, to uh, carry their bags for them. If they, if they were walking as Roman citizens, uh, Roman soldiers, amen, and they saw, praise God, a a Jewish citizen or a slave in those times, they could have said to them, take my bag and carry it with me a mile. And they had to because that was the law. And Jesus said, look here, if a man asks if I go with him one mile, go two. In other words, God is saying that the way oh, you treat them, they, 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 they must blow their mind. They must say, I'm not expect this from this person. They expect you to rebel a particular way. They expect you to behave a particular way based on what you have done to me. Amen. You are expecting me to respond in that way. But as a Christian, your character uh, must speak to Christ. Amen. Because even while he was on the cross, he was praying for the people that was killing them, was killing him. Amen. Even when they put the nail in his hand and they put the thorn on his head and blood flow. Amen. And they whip his back. Amen. It was the same Jesus who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they have done. A lot of us would have said, God, kill them. Amen. And our heart would have been at a place where God has wiped them out. But the character of the child of God should be like Christ. It speaks to your conduct as a Christian. How do you conduct yourself? Amen. As you go from place to place. Amen. Do you at work, do they know you're a Christian? Amen. How do you do your normal life dealings? Are you honest in how you do your business? Amen. Stuff like that. So the walk of a Christian speaks to his life. It speaks to his, 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 his direction. It speaks to his character. And it speaks to his conduct. But let me just make a point here. As children of God, we must realize that as we go along the Christian walk, amen, we are not going to have it scotch-free. Amen. I did speak about the valley experience earlier. But the Bible is clear in its, in its, in, in its teaching about who uh, are the enemies of the Christian. Amen. The Bible clearly tells us that our enemy is not flesh and blood. Um, but but against, what his principalities is against powers. It tells us that our enemy is not the brother or the sister that has wronged us. Amen. But the Bible clearly states to us that we have three enemies that we are at war with. Three enemies that as you walk along this Christian walk, you're going to buck upon. And I think that as Christians, we need to be fully aware of who our enemies are and who we are fighting against as we walk this Christian walk. There are three enemies. There is the world, there is the flesh, and there is the devil. I don't see any enemy there than the sister who treated you bad last week. That's not in scriptures. Or the brother who did this thing to you. No. Irrespective of what the brother did or what the sister did, we must never lose sight 
of who our true enemy is. In the day we begin to lose focus of who the enemy is, amen, is the day we are really going to lose the battle. It doesn't matter what the sister did. And trust me, people have allowed uh, things to happen to them and uh, allow themselves to, uh, to do things to people. Amen. And you can attest to that. You have seen to the house of God. You have heard of things in the house of God. Amen. But these people are not your enemies. Your enemy is the world. Your enemy is the flesh. And your enemy is the devil. Let us analyze these three enemies as we go into the scriptures. The Bible says enemy number one the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 to 16, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of lives. Is not of the Father but is of the world. In other words, here it is that John was describing or identifying uh, a real, though an impersonal, enemy. Can I tell you something, brethren? We are living in a time, amen, where the enemy wants us to be fascinated, amen, by the things that are in the world. And as we, and I want to say the things that are in the world, the world that John spoke about is anything and Everything, everything that's material or physical or social that competes with God for our attention and our affection. Let me say that again. When we speak about the world and the Bible said don't love the world or the things that are in the world, it's speaking about anything and everything that competes with God for your attention and your affection. In other words, the world... And, and, and we see it today, clearly. You know, one of the things that the devil will do? The devil will allow you to give up your prayer time because he wants you to be so in tune with this particular movie that's on show. In other words, it is the movie by itself is not bad enough, but your affection and your attention is so set on this particular thing that you're willing to, to give up spiritual things to attain that. Amen. Can I tell you something? The devil will take you into a high mountain and he will show you all the things of the world. And the funny thing is that he said, I'll give you all of this if you can bow down and worship me. Let me tell you how the devil takes worship. The devil does not take worship directly because a lot of us think that you have to bow down on your knees and worship him. No. What he wants is that you are not where you're supposed to be with God. Your worship life is not where it's supposed to be with God. Your prayer life is not where it's supposed to be with God. That's all he needs. Amen. He wants you to be so fascinated by the things of the world that you're willing to, amen, give up, amen, some of the things that are in the house of God to attain these things. Amen. You know, a lot of people, and a lot of things are not bad enough, but when you start to measure it and compare it and put it against the things of God, if this thing value more to you than the word of God, if these things value more to you than the things of God, then trust me, it is competing with God. And it is funny. There's a scripture where, where Paul and the great apostle Paul had a man that was going with him. And that man was uh, Demas. And, and Demas went on him on his missionary journeys and went on him and he, he, can you imagine now the man was out there but the, while the man was doing all the things that he's supposed to be doing or seeming that he was looking good the bible said in, in uh, second timothy chapter 4 and verse 10 that demas had forsaken me you know why having loved this present world in other words while he was traveling with paul amen there was something that catches eyes on the outside amen and demas having walked with a great man like the apostle paul a great man that we see did so many mighty things for god the bible said eventually forsake uh, uh paul and why because he loved this present world if you realize that you start to love the world so much that it that, that you can't give up some things amen and can i tell you something about the world the world is wicked it only uses you amen and you can't even keep up with it Amen. If you try to keep up with his fashion, by tomorrow it changes. If you try to keep up with his technology, by tomorrow it changes. And you will try to forever grab after straws. 
Amen. But guess what? I love the fact that these things practically don't move me from morning. Amen. I saw at the end of the day, I don't want God, the love of the world, to be so much on me. The, the, love, the loss of the eye, the loss of the flesh, the pride of life. We don't want these things to be a part of our lives. As Christians, that's an enemy. And we have to see it that way. This world is not our home. When, the Bible, when I said earlier that we are on a journey, amen, the, what comes to my mind is the pilgrims of the, of the old time. People like Abraham, who said, I look for a city. And if you notice anything about Abraham, you know, they never built structures. Amen. That were that, that 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 could not be moved. Amen. They lived in tents. And why they did that? Because they knew in, from the beginning that the promise that God gave to them, that God is going to give them a promised land. Amen. So while they were not in the promised land, he was moving through on his journey, building living in tents, living in place that as soon as God said move, he was willing to move. A lot of us have stake our stakes so deep. Amen. So, so we have made our house so strong in this world. Amen. Because we love what we see. Amen. To the point that if God said, look, it's time for us to move from here to here. Our house is so set. Amen. In other words, our lives are so set here that we cannot move. Amen. It was, it was, it was um, Lot who, as he came from Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was on his way out. Amen. The Bible said, remember Lot's wife. Because she looked back. In other words, your life can be so fixed on this world that you're willing to forsake the things of God. Amen. And God is not pleased with that. God says an enemy. And therefore, we have to see it as such. Amen. Paul, remember that Demas had forsaken him because he loved this present world. Think about yourself. And can I tell you something? A lot of people forsake the house of God. People that were in the house of God for years. They were singing on the choir. People that were in the house of God, they were preaching. People that were in the house of God, they were involved in different, different areas of missions. And it breaks my heart most of the time. Amen. All the time. When I, when I, when I, when I see some of these people come back, and I, and, and I know God can marry the backslide, and I know God can pull people back to him. But I don't know about you. It's a burden for me, knowing how the devil operates. He only sets you up. To kill you. He only gives you everything that you would want in this life. Amen. That he was trying to do with Jesus. Trying to do. But as I said earlier, Jesus knew his identity. He knew who he was. So the devil couldn't move him anyway. In your case, amen, you have to know that this world is not your home. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are just here to declare Christ in the world. Amen. It hurt my heart where the devil will sell you all of this. Give you all of these things. And at the end of the day, when you reach a certain age. Because what he does, you know. Everything the devil gives you, it comes with a cost. You have to pay. And sometimes the payment might not be now, but give it 20 years. And then you realize that the payment was really your soul. We you look at people like Michael Jackson and, Ma and all of these people who have given themselves over to this industry. And at the end of the day, when they wanted to leave because they were so unhappy. And that's what the world does. It gives you, it gives you, but you realize that it will never satisfy your soul. You'll realize that the joy that only comes from God, you will never get it. You know, a lot of people who are backslidden, no matter how they try to be happy, there is something that is wrestling inside of them that is saying that look you're not where you're supposed to be you know why because there's really no joy outside of being in God amen so the enemy number one is the world and we as children as we journey this Christian walk remember you are a pilgrim passing through remember this world is not your home amen and at the end of the day you have to continue amen walk Walk with God. Walk with God. Irrespective of what comes, walk with God. If it means you have to give up some things, walk with God. If it means saying that we get certain things that you'd want, it doesn't matter. Walk with God. Because at the end of the day, my enemy is this world. Enemy number two is the flesh. And I'm going to spend a little time here. Paul says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18 and verse 25, he says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Praise God. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I might serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Amen. So the flesh in scriptures refers to the self-centered, 
self-gratifying desire of our physical body. Amen. And guess what about the flesh? The flesh is hostile to God's inclination within us. Within us. The law of sin. So the flesh is warring against God. A warring against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And the Bible said these two are contrary one to the other. Now I want us to bring out some things about the flesh. So that we can have a realization of how this flesh operates. In Exodus chapter 17 from verse 8 to 15. We find the first war amen, that Israel had to fight when they left Egypt. And the first set of people they had to fight was a set of people that were called the Amalekites. Amen. And it's interesting because you have to look a little bit at who Amalek is and what it represented. Amen. So if we look at Genesis chapter 36 and verse 12, it says, And Timnah was concubine to Elphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Elphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. So based on the scripture that we read in Genesis chapter 36 and verse 12, Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Now what do you remember about Esau? There, Esau was the person who sold his birthright for a pot of porridge. You can remember? Or a lintage or a soup. Depend on, depend on how they look at it. Alright? Esau's grandson is now Amalek. So what we do as study, we realize that Amalek, based on the descendants and what's coming down, Amalek represents the flesh. Amen. The Amaleks and the Edomites were both from the family lineage of Edom. And that's another name for Esau, right? And the Amalek inherited Esau's hostility towards Jacob, who became Israel. So the same type of hostility that Esau had for Jacob is the same type of hostility that uh, the Amalekites had against the children of Israel. So all through their life, uh, the, the Amalekites were practically... Um, a nuisance to the Israelites. Look at this scripture in Exodus now chapter 17 from verse 8 to 11. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now this is the first battle when they came out of Egypt. Remember God sent Moses for them and brought them out of Egypt. And this is the first battle that we find where Israel was fighting against a set of people. And it says, And who these people? They were Amalek. And then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So we see where from this scripture that we, and we're going to talk about this. So we realize that the first set of people that they fought against was Amalek. Now look what Amalek did according to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17 to 19. And God now is talking to the children of Israel, amen, and telling them something. He said, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way. When ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way, and smote the hindest, the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God had given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Now, I want to read that same verse in the message. And normally I do not use the message as a study. But I think that it gives us a clear picture of what this particular verse was saying. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 25 again. The same verse according to the message. 
It says, don't forget what Amalek did to you on the road after you left Egypt. How he attacked you when you were tired. Note, the, note these things. So he attacked when you were tired, barely able to put one foot in front of the other. And he mercilessly cut off your stragglers and had no regard for God. When God, your God, gives you rest from all your enemies that surround you in the inherited land, God, your God, is giving you to possess. You are to wipe the name of Amalek from off the earth. Don't forget. Praise God. So here it is that we see an operation of Amalek. We see, we said that Amalek was a type of the flesh. So we note the following how Amalek operates. One, Amalek attack God's people, especially when they are weak, weary, or sick. In other words, you see what the flesh does. You see the flesh comes on you, amen, when you are in a place where you are weak or weary or sick. How do you become weak, weary, or sick? When you are not spending enough time in the presence of God. When you have neglected the word of God. When you are a person who doesn't come to the house of God as you should. When you are a person who practically are not living. You are sick spiritually. You are weary spiritually. You are weak spiritually. And these are the persons that Amalek attack. Amen. And guess what Amalek does? It attack and mercilessly cut off those who struggle behind. There are some saints, praise God who struggle behind in other words the devil looks for those who are at the back persons who you know the camp has gone ahead praise god and these are the people who are practically are trying to fight are trying to make and they're at the back amen and what does amalek does amalek attack those set of people because this is a weak set of people that he wants to get rid of amen that is why what the enemy does he wants to keep us behind he wants to ensure that, brethren, it's okay. You don't have to go to church. It's okay. You don't have to read the word of God. It's okay. You don't have to do that. Can you know what he's doing? He's allowing you to struggle behind. And when you go behind, what happens? And these, these uh, things come from the enemy itself. Because he knows the moment you are in the place where you should not be, the flesh is going to take back its rightful place. Amen. You were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But guess what? What the enemy does is that when it attacks, attacks you amen it attacks you mercilessly it cuts you off when it's done with you you are dead and guess what the flesh does amalek fight against israel continually in other words as long as you're a child of god you're going to have this battle with the flesh praise god now let's just look at the effect praise god of amalek you see the amalekites would come up against Israel and leave no substance in Israel. In other words, when the flesh is done with you, if you give in to the flesh, amen, when it's done with you, it robs you of your substance. It robs you of everything that you have spiritually. If you allow yourself to give in to the things of the flesh, it robs you. Look at the scripture in Judges chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they came to Gaza. In other words, they surrounded them to the point of Gaza. And left no substance for Israel. Neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. In other words, when the flesh is done with you, amen, it scrubs you of all your substance. You see, when you commit a little, a little fornication or a little this or a little that, it seems as if nothing is happening, you know. But you don't realize what is happening. The enemy is slowly robbing you of all your substance. Everything that is valuable in your Christian life. Amen. Everything of, of, of is removing all your oil. Then, are you going to be like the foolish virgins who go at the end of the day when Christ comes, give me of your oil, but there is no oil. And, and even though we know that scripture in typology was necessarily speaking about the church, we're borrowing it to say the devil wants to rob you of your substance. He wants to remove everything that is substantial in your life. And that's what the flesh does. We need to understand that the flesh is an enemy. I mean, I, I remember Minister Smith years ago preached about the, the third war, the worst enemy that we can have, and that's the flesh. Amen. Number two, the Amalekites steal all that was good and burn all that is sacred. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 to 2, it says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. Who did that? The Amalekites. They burned the place with fire and had taken women captives that were therein and slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. In other words, when the flesh is done with you, it burns all the sacred things in your life, amen, and it steals all that is good in your life. That's what the flesh does, amen. All the things that you should have, amen, when you're, when you're giving to the flesh, and I'm going to talk about what the flesh is, amen, when you're giving to the, this enemy in your Christian walk, it burns everything that is sacred that is why you, you, you wonder how is it that people operate a particular way how people do certain things a particular way because they've allowed the flesh to inherit ziglag they've allowed the flesh to come in and to burn everything that is there you know but i like the fact that in this particular scripture in first samuel david went and he recovered all so there's a possibility, amen, if you are allow yourself to be led by God, amen, to go and everything that the enemy has stolen, amen, you can get it back if you stay focused and on track. Amen. Number three. Now, I want to mention something about Amalek. Amalek. You know what was interesting about Amalek? The Bible says that God told Saul that he was supposed to get rid of all the children, all the Amalekites. If you can remember, that was the command that God gave to Saul. Get rid of all the Amalekites. And remember what, 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 what Saul did. He went to battle and he didn't kill all the Amalekites as God told him to. I mean, he left back the king and few of the goodly stuff and so on and so forth. And... And as I was preparing this, amen, as I was preparing this, I realized a scripture that jumped out at me. In 1 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1 from verse 1 to 10, and I'm going to read that one for us. 2 Samuel chapter 1 from verse 1 to 10. I'll just read and you can follow. It says, Now it came about after the death of Saul, when David had returned from slaughter of the Amalekites, that they remained two days in Ziglag. And it happened on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes uh, torn and dust on his head. Praise God. And it came about when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrate before him. Then David said to him, From where do you come? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. Praise God. And David said to him, how did things go? Please tell me. And he said, the people have fled from the battle. And also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man, who told him, how do you know that Saul and his son, Jonathan, are dead? And the young man who told him said, by chance I happened to be on the Mount Gilboa. And behold, Saul was leaning on his spear. And behold, the chariot and the horsemen pursued him closely. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called me and said, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? And I answered him, I am the Amalekite. Then he said to him, Please stand beside me and kill me. For agony has seized me because my life still lingers in me. So I stood beside him and killed him. Because that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown which he was on his head, and the bracelet was on his arm, and I brought him where, uh, brought him before my Lord. Why that verse jumped out at me, brethren? Because the same person, same set of persons, are from the same set of person that God told Saul to kill, was the same person who actually killed him, according to this record. That thing that you're holding on to, that you think that you can't let go of, is the same thing that is going to kill you if you're not careful. And you know the funny thing about it? Him say, not only did he kill him, the Bible said he took his crown. My God. That's the, that's, that's the flesh. When the flesh is done with you, everything that is valuable in your life is going to take it. What a wicked act. 
And this thing moved me because at the end of the day, brethren, we have to be careful. Like Israel who faced Amalek first as they left Egypt. The first warfare for the child of God, you're going to face it when you become a Christian. If you're a new convert, know this. If you're an old saint, you know this already. The first warfare that you're going to face is Amalek, is the flesh. But guess what? You can become an overcomer of the flesh. And if you become an overcomer, then guess what? It will allow you to be victorious in fighting any other battle. As a matter of fact, you can't move on to any other battle until you have learned how to defeat the flesh. Now, when we talk about the flesh, what are we talking about? Amen. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, hearsays, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and as such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now it's interesting how Paul spoke about this. And I just want to, a lot of us as Christians have heard some of these words and we don't know what some of them mean. So just for clarity, first of all, the works of the flesh, he already placed them in four different categories. I mean, most theologians who look at this realize when Paul wrote it, he placed the works of the flesh in four different categories. One, you have uh, the, 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 the sins of contamination. Amen. And these are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. Now, adultery, as we know, speaks to any relationship. Amen. In part with anybody that is married. If you are married and you are in sexual relationship with somebody else... Amen. You're committing adultery. Amen. And adultery is, the Bible clearly tells us in the book of Leviticus that thou shalt not lie carnally with a neighbor's wife or to divide thyself with her. Amen. And Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says that God will judge the world mongers and adulterers. Amen. So we know what adultery is. Anybody who has relation with a person who is, who is married. Fornication speaks to any illicit sexual relationship among persons who are unmarried in this context. Amen. And you know the funny thing about it? Recent time, it has become a norm for people to live a life of fornication. As a matter of fact, in many countries in the United States, many young girls engage in sexual activities from the age of 13 years old. Amen. And a lot of people find it a norm for you to, to, to live together. Amen. It's a norm for a man and a woman to live together in a house having sexual relationship and they're not married they call it common law amen but it's still fornication amen as a child of god you cannot live like that that's a work of the flesh you have to talk about uncleanness uncleanness describes uh anything that is committed outwardly amen that is an act of immorality amen um i will talk about unclean desires we talk about stuff like indulging yourself in things that 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 practically are unclean or stimulate an unclean desire. So stuff like pornography, stuff like uh, pornographic literature, amen, are dwelling in scenes that would create that type of desire. That's uncleanness. Telling smutty joke is uncleanness. Praise God. Suggestive stories is uncleanness. We have to be very careful, amen. But there's another level to this level, to uncleanness, which is also under the sin of contamination, and that's lasciviousness. Now, lasciviousness, brethren, speaks to uncontrolled loss. Uh, and, in the, and anybody who is guilty of committing uh, uncleanness are not necessarily uh, under the same banner of lasciviousness. It's lasciviousness, you become elas you, you, you fall in that category when you are no longer uh, moved. Amen. In other words, you don't even care what God thinks about your action. Amen. You, you do your, your, your public things, in, you do your unclean things in public. It's like, it's no, it's, it's no difference to you. Amen. You are no longer moved by these, by what the word of God says. And you have a lot of people who have moved themselves from just unclean things to lasciviousness. In other words, you commit something last night and you come to church and there is no form of remorse. There is no fear for the things of God. But can I tell you something? We serve a God who is a consuming fire. We serve a God who you should not play with. And it's, brethren, if you know you're not living right, it's better 
Amen. You sit back. That you're trying to come up there and force up yourself to do something. God will strike you down. God is not a God who you should play with, you know. And you can remember in the Old Testament when they brought strange fire into the house of God. Amen. We knew what happened. And the, and the preacher spoke about it Sunday. We talk about the fire of God had to come from the altar, from the brazen altar. And from that fire, they would have brought to light the golden candlestick. And these young men stopped like the fire went out. And they light their own fire and put it in the, in, in the place. Don't bring any strange thing. Don't do anything that, 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 that would anger God. Because God is a God. Don't, don't, don't play with God. God is not a God to play with. Amen. They talk about the sins of idolatry. Idolatry is an act of giving something other than true worship uh, to anything that's apart from the living God. And a preacher spoke about this quite recently about anything that can become an idol. Amen. Anything that you have placed above God. Amen. Your job can become your idol. Amen. Your, the TV show that you watch can become an idol. Your wife or your husband can become an idol. You have to be very careful. They will talk about witchcraft. I mean, these things fall under the sin of idolatry because witchcraft now is you worshipping. Amen. Are using spells and magics and, and these type of things. And you practically remove yourself from the power of God to get witchcraft and, and these things to be involved in your life. Amen. It's some form of worship. It's sorcery. Amen. It's spiritual mediums. It's necromancy. These things. When it, when it, when it, if your life not going good, it's not good for you to go to a particular place and to get indulged in certain things. Amen. Don't do it. Don't do it. They have antagonism. Things like hatred. Hatred is strong dislike. Ill feel towards somebody. Variance. You have to be very careful. That is the person who are quarrelsome. And so discard among the brethren. Amen. Then you have people at emulation. Amen. These are persons who practically uh, speaks of those who desire uh, to surpass others. In other words, it's one thing. You, you do things, but your aim of doing it is that you want to surpass people. Amen. So we can look at this. Talk about wrath. Speak about violent form of wrath. You're so angry that it comes out in your life. These are works of the flesh. Hear say. Amen. Uh, sedition, so on and so forth. We need to get rid of these things out of our lives. Overindulgence is another set. Drunkenness and reveling. Amen. We have to be very careful of children because these are works of the flesh. And as children of God, as a children of God, as a, as a walk in your life, we have to realize that there's an enemy called the flesh. And this enemy is out to get you and to kill you as it did with Saul. Our last enemy is the devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, I must be sober, be vigilant. Because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. As children of God, we must understand that the devil is, the, is, a, is a determined opponent of all spiritual growth. Amen. He will plant seed. Because he knows how your flesh operates. He will send different, different people in your life. Because or send you in companies that will practically break you down. The devils work with an army of demons that, that are raid against you. And he will ensure that at the end of the day, his very aim is to make sure that you are never saved. Amen. The Bible says, and I said before, we don't wrestle against uh, the flesh. We don't wrestle against people, sorry. But we wrestle against uh, principalities and powers. Against rulers of the darkness of this world, the Bible says, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me tell you something about the devil. The devil cannot break our trust in God. Let me just say that clearly. And the devil cannot break your love for God unless you give him the opportunity to do it. And although he is a force to reckon with, amen, he, he, he cannot override what your ultimate decision but you know why? Because the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But guess what? A lot of us don't even realize this. And we allow the enemy to just plant things and plant things and hammer us. And therefore, as Christians, understand that we are having a walk. We are in a Christian walk. And victory is ours. Now, let me just tell you now how we should walk. And we're coming down. How we should walk. We should walk in a manner worthy. That's the first thing. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
God has called us to walk worthy. And how do we do this? Amen. The Bible describes how we can walk worthy. In Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 2 to 3, it says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So the first one is with lowliness and meekness. It means not pushy, and it's not a pushy desire to defend our own rights and advance our own agenda. So as Christians, we must walk with lowliness and meanness. We're not pushing our own agenda. We're pushing what God says. And we're ensuring that we keep ourselves at the place where we do what God says. With long-suffering, you know, there was a famous theologian uh, way back in the day. He made a statement. He says, long-suffering is the spirit that has the power to take revenge, but never does it. It's a characteristic of a forgiving and a generous heart. In other words, when you're truly have for long suffering you 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 can amen take revenge you have sometimes you have the power to do it amen but guess what you never do it why because you are characterized by a forgiving and a generous heart amen that we talk about we endeavor to keep the unity amen notice god did not say we must create the unity god said we must keep the unity which means that the unity is already created in the spirit amen all we have to do is to uh, ensure and to move together in the spirit and recognize the unity that the spirit has created so we endeavor to keep that unity amen that the spirit has created in the spirit bond of peace so there must be a unity between me and you how we must walk number two we must walk honestly the bible says in romans chapter 13 verse 13 let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness not in chambering and wantonness, not in strive and envy. And I like the fact that the same walk as in the day. In other words, your, 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 your walk should be honest. Your walk should be a walk of integrity. Your walk should be a walk of that, 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 that speaks to what God would have. I'm going to say, as a child of God, our walk must be a case where, you see, there are some things that puzzle me as children of God. One of the things that always puzzle me is how is it that we are Christians? And, but yet still, there are some things that we will do. So, for example, you realize that uh, you have a particular thing to do and it's against the rules of the school. And you go contrary to that and you're doing stuff that are not honest to God. Amen. That's not a Christian because if you're caught, you know you're, you're in the wrong. As a Christian, you must walk honestly. It's better you, you do the thing yourself and get a, a, a feeling grade. That you ask, that you cheat and get a passing grade. You're not a Christian if you do that. You're not walking honestly as you should. You're doing a transaction, a business transaction, and you undermine some things, and you, you, you get some things to get more money out of it. You, you overcharge the person. That's not being honest. As Christians, we have to walk honestly. Amen. As the Bible says. Lastly, we must walk in power. And when we talk about walking in power, we're going to use that term power, P-O-W-E-R. Now, the P for me stands for prayerfully, and I'm so many it up. So, you must walk prayerfully. Amen. And when we walk prayerfully, amen, we walk in the power. To walk in power of the Christian, we must communicate with God. So, we talk about prayerfully. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. So, in other words, persons who pray are persons who are near to God. So, we talk about walking as a Christian, our walk must be in power. P, which means prayerfully. O, it must be in power. O, which means obedience. So when we walk in obedience, we must walk in obedience to what the word of God actually says. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Bible says in St. John chapter 14, verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. The Bible says, St. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. So when you see people talking about the love of God, and they're doing stuff that are contrary to what God says, and they're still doing stuff that are contrary to the word of God, it tells you that they really don't love him. You can't be loving God and going contrary to what God says. Because if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So that's the second O. When we're talking about walking in power, we walk prayerfully, we walk in obedience. Number three, we must walk in worship. The Bible says uh, that to walk in power, the Christian must be a worshipper. 
the David says in Psalms 34 verse 1, I will bless the Lord what? At all times. Not at times when things are going good. Not at times when you have food in your, in, in, in your cupboard. But at all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's what the Bible says in St. John chapter 4, I think. That the hour comes and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Amen. Because the Father seeketh such to worship him. So we walk in power. P, prayerfully. O, in obedience. W, in worship. E, in evangelism. So as a Christian, we must tell others about Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. So he's telling you what you should do. Teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So as a Christian, we must tell others about Jesus. He must be a part of our life. As a matter of fact, if you're a Christian and you're not telling others about Jesus, you will realize that you are being robbed. You realize that your Christian life is not growing as it should. Because the Christian who walks in power, walks in evangelism. It, it's a burden on your heart to see others dying. Souls dying out there and you're not able to reach them. So the Christian must walk in power, prayerfully. O, obedience. W, worship. E, evangelism. And R, the word. You must read the word. Amen. So the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. Amen. In other words, as Christians, we must always desire the word. You must always have a desire for the things of God. You see, the moment you realize, say, you don't, a week pass, I don't go into the Bible. You realize, say, two days pass, I don't go into the Bible. Realize that you are not walking in power. Amen. Because a part of the powerful experience is that you must be in the word. You see, the word of God is, is our manual. And the word of God is what is going to cleanse us. And the, and, and, and the Bible says, just like how the newborn babe desire. I have, I've heard, I've, exp I've seen something recently. A friend of mine, the baby was crying, crying, crying. And the person said to me, just watch this man. Just give it five more minutes. No, not five minutes. Just, just, and the person started to count down. And they gave the baby the breast milk. And as the baby was just fussing, 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 fussing. And as soon as they put the person on the breast, the baby just stopped. Calm down. Good. Because that is what they desire. That should be your desire. If you realize in your life that you don't have that full desire that you should, ask God to restore it. Because you must be in this book. Amen. As newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word. Why? Because it makes us grow. The conclusion of the whole thing is that the work of God, amen, should make us be like Jesus. Amen. The work of God is to make us from one part where we are in Egypt and bringing us to Canaan. Amen. The, 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 the walk is to move us from one journey where we were in under fierce control. We were under the control of the Egyptians. But God is bringing us to a land that flows with milk and honey. We're going to have hard times. We're going to come to Rephidim. We're going to come to different, different places. But don't do like with the children of Israel who are looking back and say, Boy, it was better if I was in Egypt because I had this and I had that. That's the devil's aim. He wants you to look back. Look forward. There's a song we sing at church. Forward still is Jehovah's will. God is wants you to bring you to a promised land amen a place where, where that is going to blow your mind don't be don't be don't think about all the things that are in the world that is beautiful now amen a lot of us go to places that we see beautiful things and we love sightseeing and god is saying this is that walk in the park in comparison to what he having compared for us don't run down not in this world because everything that this world has to offer amen feel in comparison to what god have ahead of us and can i tell you something the Bible says in Colossians 2.16, Therefore, as you have received Jesus Christ, or you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Walk in him. The Bible says in 2 John chapter 4, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in truth. Here John is saying that he's happy. Because they are walking in truth. Just as we were commanded by the Father. And he also said in 1 John chapter 2 verse 6, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in him. The same way in which he walked. In other words, at the end of the day, our walk is to make us like Jesus Christ. Must walk in him. Must walk in truth. He is truth. I must walk the same way he walked. Because at the end of the day, our aim is to go to the same place where he desires for us. Amen. I close here and I, and I say to you, brethren, amen, that this Christian journey, this walk, when we understand where we are coming from, when we know who we are, must realize that this journey, amen, we are along a journey. 
This place, is, this world is not our home. We are just passing through, the songwriter says. Amen. We, are, we, we, we should not be so focused. Don't be so troubled. Amen. And by what is happening. Everything that is here is only temporal. Everything that is here is going to fade away. Everything that will run down. Amen. Won't last forever. Amen. Think about the people who gave up their lives for stupidness. Amen. They thought that they, they were running down the money. They were running down this. And when they got it, they were not satisfied. Amen. Because nothing in this world satisfies. Nothing in this world is going to, can cost your soul. But be assured that as a pilgrim, you are on a journey. There are going to be mountaintops. There are going to be valleys. But be assured also that irrespective of where you are in the journey, Jesus is the one. He is the shepherd that is leading you as the sheep. And he's taking you to greener pastures. You might have a valley experience. No. Some of us are in valleys. Some of us are in mountaintops. But be assured that Jesus is with you on this journey. Understand who the enemies are. The enemies are the world. This world is not a place to play with. Amen. The things of the world is not something to desire. Amen. Because at the end of the day, it's, it, 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 it's only for here. It's only temporal. The flesh is worse. The flesh just wants to kill you, cut you off totally, and rob you of everything that you should have. And the devil's aim is to totally destroy you. He's the accuser of you. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. He takes the valuable things in your life. But we can walk this Christian walk. We can walk this Christian walk. We can walk this Christian walk honestly. We can walk this Christian walk in a manner worthy that God would have. And we can walk this Christian walk with power. We said power speaks to your prayer life. We said power speaks to obedience. We said power speaks to your worship. We said power speaks to evangelism. And we saw power speaks to you reading the word. And I pray God that tonight that somebody will continue their Christian walk as we move to next week to the Christian destiny. Because that's where we want to go. We want to know why are we walking? Where is God taking us? Amen. Where God wants us to be. Amen. And at the end of the day, we can trust God that he will bring us through. Praise God. God is a good God. Amen. And he is worthy to be praised. So God bless you as we do this Christian walk. Together, all of us can make it in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. As we, as we pray, as we pray, as we pray. Bow your heads as we pray. Amen. Bow your heads as we pray. Great God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our guide, that you are our present help in the time of trouble. We thank you, God, as we walk this Christian war, that we are not alone, but you are with us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are making us into who you want us to be, that you're forming pearls in our lives, that you're making us into the Christians that you'd have us to be. So irrespective of where we are in the journey of this Christian walk, amen, that you are the one who is making us and forming us and making us into who we would have us to be. Help us, Lord, just to trust the process. Help us, Lord, to trust you as we go from place to place in you. Help us, Lord, to move in the right direction. Help us, right now, to conduct ourselves the right way. Help us, Lord Jesus, to have the right view and the right focus in this Christian walk. I pray right now, God, that every child of God will be cognizant of who their enemies are as we go along this journey. That this world, God, is only comes to steal and to mash up our lives. To help us to realize that the flesh, uh, we should not glory in the things of the flesh. Amen. Fornication and adultery. Amen. Idolatry. Amen. Hatred and variance and witchcraft and all the things that the apostles spoke about. Help us, Lord Jesus, to make note of these things. And when they creep up in our lives, help us, Lord Jesus, to, 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 to walk in the spirit that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Help us, Lord, to realize that the enemy, the devil, is a wicked foe. And his aim is to, amen, to sow seed of discord. His aim, oh Lord Jesus, to ensure that none of us make it to the kingdom of God. He already is doomed for a devil's head. The Bible declared that, amen, the bottomless pit, amen, is preserved for him, amen, and his angels. Even right now, Lord, help us, Lord, just to realize, amen, that we don't have to go that way, but our lives can live to please you. Help us, Lord, just to walk in power, amen, to walk in 
power to walk prayerfully. Amen. To walk in obedience to your word. To walk worshiping you in spirit and in truth. To walk evangelizing this world. Because people are dying and souls need to know you. And to walk reading your word. Help us, Lord Jesus, to walk, conduct ourselves in a right way, in a, in a orderly fashion, in an honest fashion. Amen. And to realize that at the end of the day, oh Lord, this prayer walk is to frame us and to make us into look like you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being a good God in our lives as we look to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Cover us under your blood and be with us. In Jesus' mighty name I pray tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. God richly bless you in Jesus' name. Praise God. And before I go, by way of announcement, amen, I have five things to say. Firstly, service this Sunday will be for persons who are in group three and group four. So the first service will be for group three, and those are persons who are born from July, amen, to September. And the service number two, which is at 11 o'clock, uh, is for group four persons who are born from October to December, amen. Other announcement, there is, we need to keep in prayer Sister Latoya Sadler, um, that is Sister Marsha, uh, Sister Carlington's daughter. I mean, her husband passed away um, suddenly, amen, and we know how hard it must be on her right now, having gone through this. Amen. We're going to remember Sister Amy Bruff, who also lost her sister in this time. And um, we're going to be praying for, for them that God will be a comfort. God promised to not leave us comfortless, but to come to us. And as a body of Christ, if somebody in the body of Christ is going through a situation, amen, we all feel it. And we pray for them. Amen. The funeral service also for Sister Belinda's husband um, will be tomorrow. I guess, they, I, I, I think there will be a Zoom session, I think. Amen. But what you could do, if you could call the office if you want to uh, get through to that, and they will give you the relevant information. And lastly, you know, we have been praying for Sister Marsha Stewart, um, and she did a surgery today. And to God be the glory, great things he has done. That surgery was successful. Amen. And we give God glory. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that in everything we give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. So we thank God for what he has done and for what he is about to do. And I pray right now that every person here, amen, who was in tune with the Bible study, that something would have resonated with them. They would have realized that, look here, you're not the only person. This life, what you're going through, you're not the only person going through that, but you're on a journey. You might be happy now, but don't be content with the fact that you're happy because as God channels you, you're going to go through a valley. But don't worry about valley either because you're on a journey and your focus should be your ultimate aim, that place that God has in store for you. Also, be reminded that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And if we keep that in the back of our mind, then we know how to fight and where to fight. God bless you as we come back next week to look at the Christian destiny. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Jesus' name. Amen.